Good morning, everybody. It's a real privilege to be here, um, particularly uh, to follow Blake and George Green. It's just incredible. Uh, I figured with the presenters that we've got today, we were going to hear an awful lot about big, sexy innovation, the kinds that bring us iPads and wind farms and iPad-driven wind farms. And so I don't want to talk about that because they can do a much better job than me. Instead, I want to talk about why iPad-driven wind farms almost never come out of places that look like this. Now, uh, you know, there's a lot of management theory out there, and um, Blake probably inadvertently t touched on some of it um, about, you know, sort of the myth of um, efficiency. But instead of boring you with management theory, I'm going to bring some semiotics up into this house. And I'm, a, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. I want to talk about framing and anchoring and how the uh, measurements that we put around things in our relentless pursuit of efficiency. Um, you know, really kind of conspire together to eliminate creativity from our cube farms. But first I want to give you a puzzle. Now, for those of you who've seen Dan Pink's TED video, um, I actually inadvertently stole this from him, uh, but so you already know the answer, but just bear with me. The puzzle is that you have a box of matches, and you have a bunch of thumbtacks, and your challenge is to attach this lit candle to the wall. Now, I can't give you a whole lot of time to think about how you would do that, so I'm going to go ahead and tell you that the answer is that you use the matchbox as a candle holder. Now, for those of you who already knew the answer, and now that you see the answer, it's like, what else would you do with it, right? I mean, that's obviously the solution. But while you're sitting there puzzling over it, it's, it's actually very challenging. And, you know, psychologists talk about this in terms of functional fixedness, which is, you know, once we know what something does, we are unlikely to figure out another thing that it can do. But I want to talk about it in terms of framing, because framing is about decision making. See, every day we're faced with new ideas, new information. Someone hands us a box of matches for the first time, and we have to figure out, you know, what is this? What does it do? What's its context? Is it going to bite me? And once we figure out what sort of what it's all about, you know, we kind of natively stick it in a mental box, right? And we, we contextualize it. But what we're doing beyond sort of getting it fixed in terms of its function is we're fixing our decisions about that thing in the future. So we're narrowing the decisions that we're going to make the next time we're confronted with a box of matches. And just to introduce you to framing, if you're not, fam I mean anchoring, I'm sorry, if you're not familiar with it, very, very simple concept. Once you figure out that a box of matches holds things that light things on fire, it sinks to the bottom of your mental junk drawer and it doesn't come out again. Okay, so that's all anchoring is. So there are a lot of you in this room who make your living by rifling through our mental filing cabinets and pulling stuff out and going, Ooh, what's this? Why is it in this box? How come it's not in this box? What else can we do with it? But, um, and so you practice the thought processes that allow you to be creative. And it's sort of a well-known process, but if it's so well-known, then why doesn't it make its way into our cube farms? Why doesn't it make its way into our established companies that so desperately need innovation? And so I want to um, posit that part of the reason for that starts with school. Now, the way we're presented with information in our schools is um, the teacher comes in and we have an input, in this case it's some craft sticks, but it could be numbers, it could be you know, books, it could be anything. And the teacher says, hey kids, today we've got these craft sticks and we're going to you know, apply a, a process that I've already thought about for you and we've got this goal, we're going to make this beautiful house. Okay? Now that is very, very, very different than if the teacher comes in and says, hey kids, craft sticks, go crazy, have fun. If you're not given a goal, if you're not given a process, if you're not given a way to think about something, then you're going to experiment, you're going to play around, it's going to be messy, it's going to be inefficient. You might fail. You'll probably fail. You might glue craft sticks to your hair. I mean, it's just not, you know, not the most efficient way of learning. And in school, we have a lot of information that we have to cram into our heads in a very short period of time. So we have to practice doing that efficiently. Um, the way that we sort of natively take in information and make decisions is an efficient process. So schools kind of have this thing where they tap in to what we sort of natively do, where we eliminate a lot of potential decisions that we could make about these craft sticks, and we just focus on what's going to get us to our goal most effectively, most efficiently. So that's all well and good. 
it, um, it sets up a, uh, actually a structure that allows us to succeed. If you're told what your goal is, and you're told how to get there, all you really have to do is practice, right? And so it lets us succeed, and it lets us move towards our goal fairly efficiently, fairly effectively, makes us feel pretty good about ourselves. But because the decision what to do with the craft six has been framed for you, the other decisions are sort of eliminated from your mental um, box of, of tricks, right? And so the next time you're confronted with craft sticks, you go, oh, hey, I've got this. I make a house. But you're not likely to, to walk down a path that's going to let you make a race car or a dragon. So if input process output is a really great way of teaching people things efficiently, and if that's all that's required, for people to learn things in school fairly effectively, fairly efficiently, then why do we measure so much? Why are we obsessed with measuring, testing, you know, efficiency metrics, all of this junk? Why are we obsessed with that? Because it's not inherently necessary to learn how to build a, a popsicle stick house. Um, you know, it's not inherently necessary to judge your efforts against some idealized version. So the reason that we measure is because measurements set up a concrete focal point for us to, um, to fixate on, to drive towards, and it taps into this sort of innate drive that we have to get better on something once we know what it is we're supposed to get better on. Because if you're practicing building a popsicle stick house over and over again to get better, you get really bored, right? I mean, that's boring. So it's good to have something that you can kind of edge that score up on. Like, you know, it's, it, it feels really good. I mean, I see you out there. You're, you know, you're, you're still trying to get better scores on Angry Birds, right? I know you are. I see you. I can see you. It feels good. I mean, it's fun. It's good to get higher scores. It feels good to get a better score on a test. It feels really good when the boss comes in and said, you know, you totally rocked that efficiency metric this week, right? It does, okay, most of you don't know, but those of us who work in cube farmland do know this. So, <laughs> it's good. It makes us feel good, it makes us feel successful, but it also focuses our attention on driving towards that higher score. And, you know, I'm gonna argue here that getting a higher score on a video game, that's fine, that's the purpose of the game, but uh, hopefully this isn't a terribly controversial statement when I say that the purpose of going to school is not to get a higher SAT score. The purpose of going to work is not to hit some arbitrary metric. There's a different purpose that we're blinded to when our jobs are framed as hit this efficiency metric. So um, input, process, output. That's what, it's, that's what I'm talking about today. This is the way most information in our society is presented to us. It's linear, it's easy, it sets us up for success. It allows large numbers of people to do a uh, you know, reasonable amount of things in a fairly efficient manner. And it's, it's good. It's not a bad thing. But it also frames our decisions in such a way that you know, we, we practice this way of thinking over and over again such that when we get inputs, we automatically look for, what am I supposed to do with this? And a lot of people can't actually function unless they're given all three of these things because we don't practice it. We don't practice playing with the inputs. We don't practice exploring the processes or even figuring out what alternate goals could be. And that's the origin of creativity. But the other thing that this, um, this system does is it sends this kind of very subtle message that everything that has been th that can be thought about has been thought about packaged for us and there is a system out there somewhere if you can only find it so it further eliminates our uh, drive to explore new ideas so let's recap really quick. We have to frame new information so that people can take it in fairly efficiently and, and readily. When we bother to do that, it's because we want something specific, so we set up numbers to drive them towards the goal. When we set up numbers to drive them towards the goal, that becomes the focus of what they're gonna do. And all of this says to us, you know what? We don't really need you to think. Just, you know, be efficient. Follow that myth of, of, of efficiency. So, so what? What am I saying? Am I saying we should like just not measure stuff? Should we stop testing kids in school? I'm not saying that. I'm actually um, in direct opposition to Blake. I am a big fan of efficiency. Um, 
But what I am saying is something that everyone in this room already knows. Efficiency and creativity stand in opposition to one another. Established companies particularly, large groups of people particularly, have a really hard time prioritizing both, allowing for both in the same space. They usually you know, come in opposition to each other. And I just wanted to explore a little bit some of the ways that we take in information that limits our view on what's possible so that as you understand that and as you take it back to your workplaces with you know, everything else you're going to hear today, you're armed with maybe some more tools so that you can go in and you can start you know, thinking like a, a design thinker or a futurist or, or you know, any of, I mean, many of you are already creatives anyway, but start dragging stuff out of your mental filing cabinet and actually look at it and go, hey, what's this? Why is it here? Does it need to be here, really? I mean, is the colander really a colander? That's the origin of innovation, of creativity, and it's accessible to everyone. That's my message. It's not limited to the, the scads and the artists and the, and the creatives. It's accessible to the cube farms. We just have to practice the way of thinking. So that's my challenge to you today, and I really appreciate the time. Thank you.